Thank you. <laughs> Before we start, I just wanted to give you an overview of the event today. So I'll give a brief introduction about the Unfound Accelerator. I'll then introduce our excellent panel. That will be followed by uh, the team pitches. And then we will conclude with uh, voting uh, on how to distribute 10,000 uh, pounds, and, uh, which have been provided by the Cooperative Bank as a prize fund. And you as an audience will help us uh, decide how to share that money among the teams. It is quite a complex event because we have a lot of panelists, um, a lot of people that have to speak. So please, please be patient with us as we manage the logistics of this event. Um, but hopefully um, you'll, everything will run smoothly. We are running it as a webinar. So as participants, you do not appear on video and we are recording uh, this event. So before I start, I, I imagine that some of our audience is quite new to the cooperative movement um, and to platform co-ops more generally. So I thought I would start with just a description of what we mean by platform co-ops. There is no uh, predefined official definition of, of a platform co-op. This is a definition that we have found quite useful to describe it. So a platform co-op is a democratically owned and controlled business that uses an online platform or a mobile app to trade, connect people and pool resources or data. Now, just to make this a bit more real, um, I'd like to share some examples of platform co-ops that we have supported in the past before this accelerator. Um, Equal Care Co-op is a platform co-op for providers and receivers of care and it allows people to book um, care support via the platform. Uh, the receivers and the providers of care are all control democratically the organization and own the business and the platform. Signalize is a platform from British Light Sound Language Translators and for deaf people who also control democratically the organization and own the, the business. Another interesting platform that also has an international dimension to it is the Open Food Network. It, which promotes an, uh, the, uh, the creation of ethical food supply chains and provides um, a shop front for uh, ethical farmers and ethical food shops and who are all members and control uh, the business. And uh, we're really excited now to share six new emerging platform co-ops uh, who have participated in this accelerator. So what is the Unfound Accelerator? The Unfound Accelerator is a business support program for a co cohort of six teams at the early stage of setting up their platform cooperative. And I want to emphasize early stage because that's where we decided to focus this accelerator. For those that are really at the idea phase and they're eager to transform that into a business, but they're not yet incorporated. And so the, the requirements for, for um, applying to the accelerator was, first of all, that they had a team in place, because obviously for a cooperative, you can only set it up with a minimum of two or three people, that they had an idea and believed that the cooperative model worked for them, um, that they the principles and the values of the cooperative uh, model aligned with their business idea. However, we didn't expect them to have a complete understanding of all the legal forms um, and implications of, uh, of setting up a, a cooperative and that they were looking to register in the UK within the end of the year. The content of the accelerator covered um, cooperative structures and ways of working, business planning and strategy, product development and brand and marketing. And the way it was structured was um, up to now, what the teams have attended are 10 masterclasses, which were 10 full days of classes held once a week by experts on each topic. We're now at the pitch event where the teams will be pitching their business idea to this, uh, this online event and where they have a chance to win part of the 10,000 prize fund provided by the Cooperative Bank. After this pitch event, they will have one-to-one um, -one support with experts on specific issues that they want to dig deeper in. And so I just want to emphasize that they're reaching this pitch, having uh, followed all the master classes, received all the information, but they still need to uh, have one-to-one -one support to dig deeper into uh, defining exactly what their legal structure is and their financial forecasting, uh, et cetera. 
So just bear that in mind. Now, it, I would really like to um, emphasize that there are two accelerators running this year. Um, so this is the pitch event for the first accelerator, but we are already uh, accepting applications for the second edition that will run uh, in the autumn and applications, uh, the window for application closes on the 28th of July. So if after this event, you think that the accelerator might be for you or for anyone uh, that you know, please share information about the accelerator because we're really eager to, to hear about your ideas. So how will the day run today? Um, I will briefly introduce our panelists. Um, after that, we will hear from each team um, who will uh, present their business idea. We will then have a Q&A with the panelists. So only the panelists will get a chance to ask questions uh, to the teams. However, we really would like to get as much interaction from the audience as possible. So please use the chat um, to ask questions to the teams that each team has one person who's, who will be following carefully the chat and answering your questions. We'll be also pasting a form in the chat where uh, you can select the team that you would like to connect with and you can use that either to offer support in kind or suggestions for their business idea, et cetera. So please, please do use that if you want to provide your contact details, for example, to, to a specific team. We will then vote on uh, how to distribute the money. You will get the chance to rank your top three preferences uh, and then we will announce the winners. So I would like now to introduce our panelists. Uh, so Leila, if you would like to start um, adding them to the Zoom. Um, so we have Rose Marley, uh, our CEO at Cooperatives UK. Um, Catherine Douglas, Managing Director of her SME at the Cooperative uh, Bank. And Marta Bryant, founder of Big Revolution that supports uh, tech companies. Um, so I'll pass it on to Rose if you want to say a few a few words and then Catherine and, and Martin. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Bika. Thank you for all your hard work in this really important area of cooperative development. I'm really excited this evening, not least because the amount of people joining us today on this live pitch session that we've done for the first time. But actually, there's two specific reasons. Uh, one is that the, you know, the cooperative principles, I should, sorry, just Vika did say I'm the CEO of Coach UK um, and we're, we're based in uh, Manchester and, and operate nationally. Um, but um, I'm fairly new to the role. I started in 2021. But the, one of the reasons that I really wanted to work more closely with the movement uh, to support and, and deliver uh, greater awareness of cooperatives is because of platform co-ops. I absolutely believe that they are the future of business, the principles of cooperation, particularly around one member, one vote, and how that works really well with tech in enabling this kind of choice and decision-making for both suppliers and, and uh, you know, the, the members themselves. It's really, really exciting. So I do believe um, so cooperative platforms are the future of business. And I really do believe that you are the new uh, pioneers uh, of the movement. So the second reason I am really excited to be here is to see, you know, we, we met you at some of these uh, uh, organisations 10 weeks ago, and it's just going to be great to see how the ideas have developed and enabled and I'm really really looking forward to, to hearing next steps for you all so thank you very much for inviting me to uh, judge and I'm looking forward to seeing the results thank you uh, welcome and thank you Rose and Catherine would you like to go next introduce yourself yeah, certainly. So hi, hi, everybody. I'm Catherine Douglas. I'm the Managing Director for SME at the Cooperative Bank. And um, like Rose, I'm really excited to be here this evening. It's, uh, it's great. And I'm looking forward to seeing how uh, your ideas have really developed um, since we met you a few weeks ago. And at the Cooperative, we're really sort of keen to support other cooperatives, which is why we really enjoy working um, alongside uh, Cooperatives UK and The Hive. And I think these kind of support programmes are, are really fundamental. So it's just great to be part of it all and see you all again tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you for being here. And Martin, over to you. 
Uh, yeah. So uh, most of my work is with um, VC backed companies uh, who are, uh, you know, the typical small little startup who want a big exit and just focus on growth and making a nice exit for a handful of investors. And that's fine. But I think there's room for a lot more uh, in, in terms of variety in, in tech and new ways of making uh, making for a, a more uh, equitable and interesting approach to the internet and fair and all of that wonderful stuff. And I've uh, coming from the North of England, I've got that kind of cooperative spirit running through my blood and my DNA somehow. So uh, when I first heard about this program a few months ago, um, I thought it sounded fantastic and uh, really was very interested to learn about platform co-ops. And uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing what everyone's got to offer today. Thank you very much, Martin, uh, for being here. Okay, so... We are going to start with the pitches now. Um, so the first team, we have Saida uh, from WeGuild, who will be presenting. Welcome, Saida. Over to you. Hello, hello. Thank you very much, you all. I'm just going to start sharing my screen and start my presentation straight away. Uh, okay. Can everyone see and hear me properly? Yes. Okay. Amazing. So here we go. My name is, ooh, now, yes. My name is Daida Palma and I am a freelance dance teacher based in London. Early last year, my teaching went fully online, but my laptop was 10 years old and couldn't handle Zoom calls. I had some savings, but not enough for a new laptop, and I was very worried about the uncertainty of the situation. I shared my issue with some friends and they chipped in for me. With their help and my savings, I got a new laptop and started teaching Zoom after that. They saved my source of income for months to come, not to mention the sense of community and gratitude that I got from their gesture. Humans are naturally inclined to help each other. We enjoy helping others and being helped can be materially and emotionally vital. So we ask ourselves, how do we share this sense of support among a wider group of people? Could we use technology to create networks of financial mutual aid? Could technology enhance solidarity? There are over 5 million people in the UK who are self-employed or under zero-hour contracts, many forced into a gig economy of uncertain income without access to sick pay or other forms of financial cover. Not everyone has personal savings, insurance or loans to cover financial shortfalls. And additionally, these options do not promote or enhance community and solidarity. Through the platform we are building, you can build grassroots networks of financial mutual aid to help absorb financial blows such as equipment breaking or income loss due to sickness or injury. By connecting with individuals you know and trust, you can ask for help when you need it and you can donate when you are able. WeGuild will provide a collective alternative to individualistic band A's while maintaining personal freedom and judgment. It will bring about a change in culture based on trust and transparency. Our first approach will be niching down to freelancers, aiming to reach 10,000 users by 2023. Anyone else is welcome to join the network, of course, at any point. Students, part-time employees or groups of friends will also be able to use our platform. And how does WeGuild work? When you join WeGuild, you link up with people that you know and trust. They will be your network together with their respective trusted friends. Do you need help? As for it, the app distributes then the help request and everyone in your network can chip in to help you out. If people in your network need help, they can also ask for help and you can then chip in for them. To keep things balanced, WeGuild uses a color code to help you easily assess the state of your exchanges with your network. Means and goals are equally important to us. That's why WeGuild only makes sense as a multi-stakeholder cooperative. We want to be held accountable for our mission and be owned and run by our workers and users. Self-organized mutual aid groups have existed for centuries. However, until now, there has not been a digital platform available to facilitate this form of peer-to-peer -peer exchange in the UK. WeGuild will fill this gap in the market. 
Due to the way it works, friends forming trusted networks and inviting others, we give this a model with high scalability. Let's say Kate successfully invites six of her friends and those friends invite an average of four each. Following a progression like this, we should have passed 10,000 users by the end of 2023. With the three pounds monthly fee, the platform would generate around 30,000 pounds per month of revenue with a base of 10,000 users. In 2020, we developed and tested our first user interface prototype. Right now, we are in the process of incorporating a multi-stakeholder cooperative. In October 2021, this is this year, we'll be launching a crowdfunding campaign with some important goals in mind. Validate the idea, raise funds to develop the platform and enroll our first 100 users. By mid-2022, we will have the first version of the web app available for new members and users, so we can look forward to breaking even at 10,000 users. At the moment, we are a team of four resourceful people. We live in a housing cooperative and have expertise in coding and ethical technology, marketing and psychology, arts and project management, finance, web and graphic design. We all envision a world where cooperation and equality are the norm and not the exception. We Guild mainly needs two things. The first one is exposure. As our crowdfunding campaign is approaching, We Guild needs to reach as many people as possible. So please subscribe to our newsletter. You can find the link to our website on the chat. And we also need support. So if you like the project and you think you could contribute in some way, get in touch, please. We Guild, chip in for each other. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Zaida. Um, now, Guglielmo, who is also from WeGuild, will be answering questions from our panelists. Uh, so, Leila, if you want to bring the panelists on as well. Perfect. Thank you. So, Rose, would you like to start if you have any comments or, or questions? Oh, I absolutely do. And thank you, Zahida. That was really succinct and clear. And it's brilliant the way that you've developed and I believe incorporated through this period. So congratulations. Well done. Really excited that you've joined the movement. And um, I think what I really like about this is it, it taps into something that we all no, who, who hasn't paid for a friend on a night out, you know? Uh, who, who hasn't given someone that extra 50 pence to get on the bus, even someone you don't know, because you can just see they need it and you've got it and you don't need it. And, and that is the solidarity and cooperation. And I know you've not got the platform ready until 2022, but I'm wondering, what have you done to test that instinctively? I feel like this is a really strong idea, but what, what have you done to test that? Well, we've done user surveys. Uh, to start with, and at the same time, we had a prototype that we tested um, as Cider Set in October. And um, with that, we tested the idea and not with the payment mechanism, but the information about the payment um, is something that in the issue service that we carried out, everyone said, like, we're happy about it. Of course, ultimately, we cannot really test until we have the prototype going with the payment system because that is the actual working of the, of the platform. But for that, we need to incorporate to be able to connect the API of the payment mechanism to the actual software that we're developing at the moment. So does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Uh, Catherine, if you want. No, that's, that's great, thank you. And I think, again, you know, I agree with Rose, a fabulous, uh, fabulous idea, um, you know, really, really like it. Have you done any validation of the idea though? You know, have you sort of spoken to many people about it to see what kind of take up you may get? Well, we have already Facebook and Instagram uh, with um, like almost 300 people on Facebook, a few hundred, uh, like 150 on Instagram. We have about, I think, 80 or 90 people on our newsletter and, um, and they actually reply. We did a survey as well recently to check some ideas about the platform and there was a take up of, I think, 20 people replied on that. Um, again, the people who have so far replied, they seem very positive about it, uh, but you know, we don't want to be naive. I mean, ultimately, the test of the actual product is what really will determine. Part of the crowdfunding campaign is um, a side asset market validation. So that will also tell us a lot about whether this is something to really go you know, full power or to think about maybe we need a bit of um, a redirection. Okay, that's great, thank you. 
Uh, please, Martin, go ahead. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, um, I was just wondering uh, who you consider your competitors to be, because um, certainly I'd say there's there's probably something more along these lines in terms of existing online behaviour in the US. Um, the idea of supporting other people through um, cash and that kind of thing uh, tends to be more of a thing that you see uh, in, in the States, which maybe tests yeah. more about the States than anything else. Uh, but I just wondered if you have any idea of who you're competing against, whether it's a particular existing online behavior or uh, existing businesses. Uh, well, it depends on how you would use it. I mean, if you, would use, if you were to use Wiggle to get things like um, uh, sick pay or like uh, to get some money to get some equipment, I guess you could say, well, maybe you're competing with insurance companies. Maybe you're competing with, with a bank to give you a loan for equipment. Maybe you are competing with, uh, in terms of the product itself, there is nothing that would be competing at that. I know that sounds very nice. We have no competitors. Uh, yeah. But it would depend on how you would be using it for. Uh, in that respect, yes, you would have some competitors here and there and there. Uh, depending on how people want to use it. We are in the same way that we are niching down the, uh, the, the people, that the users the, that we want to, to enroll first as self-employed, that would come with it, that would bring with it a niching down of what use the platform would be for. But eventually, you know, we would be happy for people to organize their own cultures as to what this should be used for. It's, it's up to people, really. Does that answer? Yeah, I, I digressed a bit. Yeah. Thank you, Guillermo, and thank you for the panelists for your questions. Um, I think we can move on now to Crystallizer with David. Thank well, you, Victor. David. Yes, thank you. Let me just find my uh, presentation here. Uh, I think we do. We can only see part of your slides at the moment. How about that? Yes, perfect. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I got there, I got there. Right, let's start at the beginning. Um, hello, everybody, and hello to uh, friends who have uh, joined um, on our invitation, uh, to colleagues and, um, and panelists, fellow panelists. Um, so Crystallizer um, is... Uh, is operating in South London as, in a small but very, uh, we hope, uh, impactful way. Um, I'm David Randall, I'm co-chair of Crystallizer, a multi-stakeholder marketplace for community investment across the South London subregion. So what's the problem that we're trying to, uh, we're trying to resolve? Uh, I've got one problem I've got to resolve, I've got to move people's names away from my notes because <laughs> they are currently obscuring them. Just, ah, there we go. Um, in two words, it's economic stagnation. Uh, it's the failed schemes and the budget cuts which show that traditional economic development to get us out of this mess just isn't working. Communities and the small business people and the self-employed that make up um, a large part of those communities are becoming systematically left behind. Much development, <clears throat> which looks like economic development, really isn't. It's organizations giving themselves a makeover it's construction with no outreach or involvement with local SMEs, and money is continuing to leave the local economy. Systematic flaws in local economic development are shown here on the left, but what we need to do is move from the top two quadrants on the right, where things are done to us or for us, to the bottom two quadrants, where things are done with us and by us. Uh, this is where community wealth building and asset-based community development um, is done. And thank you to Cormac Russell for that slide. So this is where we are. We suffered the biggest uh, budget cuts in London, uh, UK wide. Uh, we won't get redressed with the Build Back Better policy. And the self-employed are sitting with horrible incomes <coughs> below minimum wage, like £14,400. But here are seven people who are challenging the status quo. So this is the Crystallizer team. Uh, and we cover a range of skills from finance through to operations uh, making uh, local activism, activism platform, architecture, etc. What do we want to do to improve things? Well, we want to see more collaboration between the local buyers with deep pockets and those social value businesses operating or potentially operating in the local area. 
uh, we want to create jobs and employment. Um, and we want to do community wealth building using our digital platform that will bring us together. Our platform will fill a gap. Uh, it will simplify the tendering process, allowing anchor institutions to find social value SMEs. This is something that they're experimenting with in, in Birmingham, and we're learning from them about that. We'll motivate the anchor institutions to, uh, to think hard about social value and how to maximize social value. And we'll enable local SMEs to jointly bid on large contracts that are usually out of reach for them. And here's some examples of the supply chain transformation that we want to do with our platform. Example one is a council wanting an event expert to run an award ceremony. Well, we could help a freelancer to get that job. Uh, a leisure center wants to open a cafe. Uh, well, we can help a local business to get them that contract. And the NHS wants to build better te technology for adult social care. Well, a local technology consultancy can be part of that long-term project. Uh, we can't do this on our own. We need buy-in from the stakeholders, uh, in particular the SMEs and the local anchor institutions and social partners that support them. Uh, and we have started consulting with them. Uh, they do support us um, and they're waiting for the results of this accelerator to see uh, what solution we come up with. Uh, collaboration of this kind, though, does take, does take time. We're about three years into this. What's the revenue model? Well, we've got a diverse source of revenue. We've got off-platform funding sources through donations and crowdfunding. And on the platform, uh, well, the SMEs will be paying a subscription and the anchor institutions will pay a bigger subscription, but they'll pay something um, that we're tentatively calling a social value premium, uh, which is collected when the contracts pass through the platform. And this premium is cash that can be used to reinvest in our community and its SMEs. Our action plan, there are four phases in the next 12 months. Uh, we start with two raise, uh, with one raise, and then we do two phases, and then another one, which will be the major investment to finish building the platform. And then we're gonna do something exciting, very exciting in, in stage four, which is to do something that few are doing, even in community wealth building, which is to allow citizens to have a direct say in how this social value premium, this cash, can be reinvested in things that they want to do. Uh, we're going to scale up, we're going to multiply uh, because we think this platform can be used by other communities. Um, it will be open source software that other people can replicate internationally as well. And to help us, if you will, uh, we'll drop the, uh, the link into the chat. Uh, we'd be very grateful if you could complete our survey. Uh, we're continuing with our research and we'd like your participation. Thank you very much for listening and thank you Vika and the team for giving us this wonderful opportunity which we've enjoyed immensely. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that. And I'll invite the panelists back over to you, Rose, if you have any questions. Uh, yes, please. Uh, David and Crystalliser, if you fix this, this will be <laughs> so impressive. It's a problem across the land, isn't it? Um, and actually, it's a problem that, you know, local authorities do want to fix. And you know, that, that's my question, really. How in, in London, in the local authorities that you're talking to, how, how do you decide which, have you got any idea of what kind of local authorities are, what the drivers are at their end for those to be the, the right organisations? But then also, you know, there's some great models across the UK. Preston's particularly strong in some of these areas and might not have the tech to go with it. But what learning are you doing from councils who are you know, doing this, uh, doing this well, maybe not necessarily through um, a tech platform. Thank you, Rose. Well, we're learning from CLES because CLES have been working with many of those councils that you've been talking about. Um, we're learning through the dialogue that we've already had with the with three three local authorities in a little bit more detail. Uh, four local authorities, if you if you include one that we had a short meeting with, um, they see the need for a third party organization like a platform that will enable the various parties to come together because what they don't want to do in a quite a disparate uh, sort of political, uh, geographic and economic sort of setup, they don't want any of them to be the one that has to coordinate everything. They would like that to be done for them. Um, and they can see that this, is, um, that this is potentially something that they could support. But we're really rose to be honest at the beginning of a very long journey and there's going to be a lot of dialogue and a lot of input before we get there, I think. Thank you. 
Catherine? I know that, that's great. Uh, again, you know, if you can crack this one, I think uh, it would be a fantastic opportunity for uh, a lot of people and a really great way of working, I think, really. To be fair, you've, you know, I was going to ask what kind of feedback you've had, but I think you know, you've answered that with Rose, that it's, it's the beginning of a very long journey, but you are getting some positive um, kind of feedback and um, acceptance. This is just something that they would like to do, so good luck. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. Um, Martin, do you have any comments or questions? Yeah, I was interested in this because uh, I did some work with a startup last year that is working in a similar, um, basically the same space in a way, um, helping companies with the intelligence about um, upcoming contracts, upcoming you know, bids that they can get involved in and the kind of extra data they need to help um, um, submit a, a successful bid. And um, one thing that came out of that was just the, um, the way that... Uh, certain people are very good certain companies are very good at bidding for things and in the end it all tends to come down to price doesn't it and how so how are you support how will you support companies in in winning these contracts when in the end it often comes down to the people with the scale to put in the lowest bid yeah well we're borrowing from the community wealth building strategists um, who say that uh, you know bidding for these uh, tenders is not a charity play. You've got to be fit to supply. So the question is, how do you get SMEs to a stage when they can be fit to supply? Well, we can help them. We can help with with their financial probity. If they're too small in scale, we could connect them with other SMEs so they can scale up a little bit. Uh, and we can signpost where they can get access to to business building funds. I think that's the answer because they're not going to get this work unless they can actually do it. You're right. Great, thank you very much, Crystalizer. And again, thanks to the to the panelists. We now move on to Colin with African Futurist Arts. Hi everybody. Let's get my screen going. One second. Great. Um, I'm Colin Charles, and this is African Futurist Arts. We're here to tackle inequality in the creative economy. Um, we're distributing movies and films and opportunities uh, to people who are less connected to the creative economy, which incidentally is worth generates two and a half trillion dollars a year. Now, if you upload your work to one of the big platforms, you're giving them the right to do what they like with it. And as things stand, value is flowing upstream to the giants. Well, the great thing about a digital platform is that wherever you are in the world, that value can flow back down to you. Um, and we're here to try and help that happen. Uh, let's have a look in our own small way. Um, when it comes to ideas, unlike Netflix or Disney, we're not charging a subscription to view. We'll have advertising. And we'll insist that the ads are made by our members so that they're as beautiful as the films. Not mind control ads, uh, uh, driven by cookie data, but advertising as art. And, and not a gig economy where people's work is, uh, is commoditized and traded at the lowest price. But to compete with the ad agencies for high value work. And we aim to protect our members' intellectual property. We aim to help through our platform also, small TV stations, to sell their productions to other small TV stations. Working with our membership to add value, create trailers, posters, and graphics. Um, right now we've published two books and we've got two more in the pipeline. Um, Books commissioned and produced by African Futurist Arts are sold uh, 
uh, print on demand and we'll, we'll scale up by uh, building pre-orders. We're reaching out to writers, poets, illustrators, printers, publishers, uh, and photographers. We've also um, got a couple of films uh, in the pipeline, a few films in the pipeline. Some of them are made, uh, some of them are in production, and some of them are in um, <clears throat> development. Um, our primary audience is creative people. They can both contribute to our platform and appreciate what's there. In two months time, we should be ready for our first event. And that event will be a poetry contest, a global poetry contest. Um, we've tested our prototype uh, website uh, uh, and it's live right now, africanfuturist.com. And we aim to publicize this uh, poetry uh, contest through uh, our own network and through uh, research. We're gonna research uh, art galleries and um, poetry societies uh, in communities that we're interested in. And we'll invite poets to film their poem on their phone for a prize of a thousand pounds. This time next year, we hope to have over 500 members. Um, we'd be happy if, uh, if we had a working ecosystem as well, um, but we'd be content to be smaller. Um, we've built a team to do this and they're working in various areas. Uh, commercial, that's Rudy and um, uh, <clears throat> um, intellectual property, finance and governance, uh, film production, um, coordination, tech strategy, uh, creative development, and um, tech development, web development. All of this, um, with the, uh, with the values and um, principles of a cooperative. It's early days. So naturally we'll sense test and go along as we go along. And most importantly, we'll keep moving forwards in step with a large membership of creative people because building a business is really about building a community. Finally, the global creative economy is huge and it's growing and your vote today and your support tomorrow could help level the playing field in a small way. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Colin. Okay. Have I stopped sharing? Yes, thank you. And we're having our panelists join again. Catherine, would, would you like to go first now with questions? Is that okay? Yeah, certainly. No, so it sounds, uh, you know, Colin, I think it's uh, very inspiring what you're trying to achieve. And I think it's great that you're really trying to sort of get that global um, aspect to it as well, with, even though, you know, also with the focus rather on the UK. Um, it sounds like, as you, and I think you said, you know, it's very, very early sort of stages of where you're at. What, what do you see sort of your biggest hurdles at the moment? How are you going to overcome them? Um. Uh, right now, we're looking at uh, being able to cope with a spike in, in interest. And we're looking at ways to piggyback off other platforms. Um, we, we don't think we could build a platform that's strong enough. I, I think we could accept a, a good number, but a real big spike. And then our, our site falls down. So we're really looking at that right now. Okay. Yeah, and is there, is there any particular sites that you've already started to sort of work with and explore? Um, um, uh, no, we're still looking at it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Martin, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, really interesting uh, concept. Um, in terms of 
your ambition? Where do you see this? Um, what do you see this looking like in, say, five years' time? In, in five years' time, I think the main thing is there's lots of people out there who are, who are working in a job they don't like or working in a job that doesn't earn them any money. And, and it would be great if creative people could think, I'll give up my job and start doing what I love. And um, that wherever they were, if they weren't near a big city, um, if they weren't near one of the big commercial centers, they could still um, work with us. Thank you. And Rose, do you want to go next? Yeah, Colin, just to let you know, you'll see it when you finish, put some really brilliant comments on the chat for you. So I'm just going to, um, I'm, I'm going to ask Joseph's question because it was something that I was also thinking about. It's about engaging the creative ad agencies in, in less connected economies and just a little bit more about um, your income streams because you, it's quite a challenge what you're trying to do, enable it for everybody, but you do still need to be sustainable um, economically so it's just how you're going to manage that um, uh, challenge really okay what's quite interesting is that the the creative economy is growing at, at a rate and uh, UNESCO is really looking at it and thinking it won't be long before it's 10 percent of our global economy and look at these advertising agencies they really need to step up and make sure they're providing serious jobs, serious people. So I think that the world is moving in that direction. Right now we're looking at 3% of the global economy, which is a huge number already. And uh, people are also noticing, people like UNESCO, is that in the creative field, uh, it's 50-50, men and women. Also, it really favors younger people. And so this really works for, for those other parts of the economy where, where people can't really get in. Um, I know you asked me a different question. And so I say we've got a whole bunch of uh, income streams. Um, um, one of them is through selling advertising and making sure that part of the money from that reaches our members. But also where I said talking about uh, small TV stations and us being a marketplace for TV programs uh, where we can have in our platform, we can have people who produce TV programs and also people who consume them. And we feel like that we can add value and, and uh, have an income stream from there. Brilliant, Colin. Thank you. I really do hope uh, lots of people are saying on here how needed it is for all creatives. So if you disrupt and, and break this market again, it will be a very significant pioneering moment. So thank you for uh, your presentation, Colin. Thank, thank you, you, Rose, Martin, Catherine. And do you answer. There are lots of questions in the chat. So do uh, connect with people there. Over to Red Brick Language School. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome, Bernie and Lucy. Over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Bernie. I'm a co-founder of Red Brick Language School. It's an online English school and a worker collective. I began teaching English as a foreign language in Tokyo in 1998. Uh, we all know that zero hour contracts can be problematic, but they sometimes kind of work and they did for me, but this was reliant on the goodwill of my boss. I was lucky and then suddenly I wasn't. I got three new bosses who did not care how long I'd worked there or that I had childcare responsibilities and I lost a third of my income. I don't want this to happen to other teachers. Hi, I'm Lucy. I've been teaching on and off for 10 years, taking an admin a job when I became disillusioned with the English as a foreign language model four years ago. On furlough, I decided that teaching full time was for me. Bernie asked me to join her and here I am today as co-founder of Redbrick. 
So what's the problem with the English as a foreign language industry? Well, teachers are exploited in numerous ways. The lack of job security and all the poor working conditions associated with the gig economy exist. Teachers are undervalued as professionals. They're the bottom rung on the ladder. Students all too often receive a bad deal because profit is prioritised over learning. And what impacts teachers impacts students. The pandemic has changed the world. Learning online is booming. Students have found it's more convenient, cheaper, more flexible and greener. So what will Redbrick offer teachers? Fair and just working conditions, autonomy and respect for all and a democratic flat structure. Redbrick will offer students a chance to study in an ethical school in an industry lacking in this. The chance to have a say in how the school is run and an online English language community. So we have two revenue models. The transactional model has three different revenue streams, a pick and mix of modular courses, private one-to-one -one and cell phone group classes and bespoke courses. We also have a subscription model with three different streams, our tried and tested speaking clubs offering fluency practice, language doctor surgeries providing students answers to their English language problems, and donations that will help fund our subsidised classes for immigrants. Teachers will donate their time planning these classes. The adult online English mar language market is worth £4.2 billion. Assuming 50% of this is lost to indirect competitors, our target market is £2.1 billion. 0 0.002 of our target market represents a turnover of 43,000. To give you an idea of how we can achieve this, we need 220 students with an average spend of £196. Our ambitions for the first 12 months are extremely modest as we want to build our community, test our courses and clubs. Building up our clubs in the first 12 months will generate another 15,500, which works out at two clubs a week with 12 students. The opportunities to scale our platform are massive. Growth in the sector is predominantly online and this has been accelerated by the pandemic. The global online market is expected to grow by 18% annually and will reach 15.3 billion by 2027. So what does this mean for Redbrick? In 18 months, we'll have 10 teachers and a turnover of 150,000. In three years, will be a multi-stakeholder co-op with students as members, have 30 teachers and offer digital course supplements. In five years, we'll have autonomous e-learning courses and plan to offer other languages. So what we're asking from you today is to please spread the word about Red Brick with anyone who might be interested in studying with us. We're also particularly interested in partnering with international unions and cooperatives. We'd also love it if you support us on social media and spread the word of Red Brick virtually. Um, please subscribe to our newsletter. The link will be in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy and Bernie. So if we can have our panelists um, again. Let's see, great, thank you. Um, maybe Mar Martin, would you, do you feel like going first? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, interesting. So uh, I can see how the cooperative model helps the, the teachers. Um, how do, you've, you've got the students as stakeholders in the cooperative as well. How does the cooperative model help the students, um, especially because there will be more churn of students than there will be of teachers? Um, how will you compete with uh, you know, the, the, the well-funded uh, rivals you've got out there um, with, with a cooperative model in a way that makes sense for the students? Yeah, that's something we've been um, working on. So I think one of the reasons that we put it as an ambition for three years for the multi-stakeholder co-op is that really we want the students' input on how to make them members. So 
for the first three years were just planning to be a worker collective but that doesn't mean that students won't benefit students will totally benefit from this because they are totally exploited as much as the teachers in the current system they're putting classes that are the wrong level for they're misled about courses things like that also we're using certain teaching techniques using a flipped classroom where the students basically minimize the amount of time that they're in the actual classroom, which is where it's expensive and they can collaborate with each other as well as having teacher support online, which is one of the benefits of online learning, which makes the lessons cheaper or makes the course cheaper overall. So we will ultimately be able to compete on price providing a package of courses even if the time in the classroom maybe might be less but we believe that the learning that the students will achieve at the end will be more significant i hope that answers your question yeah sure thanks um, sorry i think i was muted <laughs> catherine would you like to go next yeah, certainly so. A great, thank you very much. It's an ambitious plan and you shared uh, your ambitions with us, which is great to see. And I think you quoted to begin with about 220 students uh, you want to bring on board. So how, how do you plan to access those students and use any connections you may well have? I mean, obviously we shared, we've got social media accounts, but uh, I'm interested just to how you're going to uh, attract those students to you. Um, well, one of the things that we want to do is we're currently working with a um, a contact in Japan, for example, who's going to act as an agent. So agents can often be problematic in the ethyl industry. So we want to create relationships with agents that are transparent. So the students don't pay extra money to the agents. Any students we get from an agent will come out of the profit that we would make, obviously through social media. And um, we're also looking at hopefully partnering with other co-ops and unions internationally. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Rose, please go ahead. So thank you, uh, Bernie, Lucy, uh, really uh, thorough business plan there, clear trajectory, you know, achievable targets. I felt it was really well uh, laid out in, in, in that perspective. When I first met you, um, I was asking about Duolingo and thinking that would be the kind of competitor you've got. And you very eloquently explained to me about the human interaction and the experience that you're going to provide. So, so now you've kind of done 10 weeks of development. Who are your competitors? Um, well, we think our competitors are basically other online organisations. Um, but the market is so big and we believe that students are thirsty for an ethical alternative. You know, when I spoke to students, they were shocked at the way teachers were treated and they feel that they want to do something to stop that and they want to be part of something positive. And research shows that particularly younger people would choose an ethical organisation and also an organisation that is better for the environment than what it isn't. So I think that's one of our selling points. We're sourcing all our support things like how we're posting, we're using green web posting. So all these things will allow students to feel, um, feel like they've made a good choice, you know, not just for them, but for everybody. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, again to our panelists and to Red Brick. Uh, we now move on to Zachi from Dopo. Uh, Zachi, you are muted. Sorry. After a year and a half on Zoom, and uh, <laughs> I can't get it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Said, welcome to DOPE, um, the overdue upgrade to abortion care. I'm Zachi, um, I'm the founder of this community. Um, so I just want to start, many people are like, why abortion? Um, so after my own abortion, it was the loneliest period of my life and the lack of support and community around it stayed with me a long while after. 
So DOPO is inspired by experience and also the experience of the people that for the past four years I've supported uh, through their abortion experiences. It's built from necessity and it's created with care. And now I <laughs> moved to a we, and we hope that you will also be part of DOFO. So where are we at with abortion care in England and the UK? So one in three women will have an abortion um, in the UK before the age of 45. Um, we do know that this women is not inclusive, but that's the way data is um, collected. So we will use that term here. Um, and last year, this meant that 209,000 uh, people had abortions um, in England. So um, what happened during COVID? One of the biggest updates to abortion care was that the UK government or the, English, the British government um, allowed telemedicine, which meant that you could have both abortion pills at home. This improved abortion care for the first time in over 40 years, I think. This improved autonomy of people, there were less burden on clinics, improved accessibility and less waiting time. However, although that's a great improvement, there are still two problems um, that we've identified and that we will be tackling when it comes to abortion care. The first is that care ends with pregnancy and that sort of makes sense, but it means that we're not looking at the whole person, we're not looking at their emotional needs, the needs for their mental health, their social needs. Um, there's little to no space to receive other forms of care outside healthcare, and there's little to no space to provide other forms of care outside of healthcare. Added to this, um, as I said before, there's no care beyond healthcare. Um, so people resort to Dr. Google and are met with a lack of accurate and inclusive information. There's the perpetuation of stigma, um, which also means why there aren't communities generally around abortion which means that people don't have spaces to talk, to share their experience and to uh, support each other. Um, and this leads to a lot of isolation of, around the experiences, which is something that I felt personally and also the people that I have supported in these past four years since I've become been an abortion doula have also shared with me. So our solution or one of our solutions, why we're here today um, is a mutual peer-to-peer -peer support platform. Um, it's a virtual space which fosters mutual peer-to-peer -peer support through, holistic, through a holistic approach and meaningful conversation. And this will be for people before, during, and before, during, and beyond their abortion. And when we say beyond, we mean uh, whether they had an abortion last week or like, for instance, that people come, that come and seek care from me had an abortion five years ago or 10 years ago. They'll be able to access healthcare, community care, and self-care. Um, and like with everything we do at DOPO, the focus is on people, not pregnancy or politics, and care, not choice. It will be a meeting space for providers and um, or people that provide support and people that are seeking support. So where are we at right now? So between May, May and June, we trained 70 uh, people to support people that have had experienced abortion. 20 of those, that was an international group, by the way, 20 of those are um, interested in being on our platform um, and offering virtual support. We're currently finalizing the onboarding journey for support seekers to prioritize their privacy and safeguarding because we do recognize that that may be a barrier for them to enter the platform. So a little bit about money. Um, to join the platform, it will be a one pound a week subscription. Um, and we, based on like, my own experience with the people that I've supported and the research that we've been currently doing. People are likely to stay on for three months for their own care and beyond to then start providing care to others. We already support, we all already provide training for people that want to become abortion doulas. Um, and that's why I mentioned we just finished training our first cohort of 70 people. We provide one-to-one -one groups, one-to-one -one and group support sessions for people that have experienced abortions. And we're also looking to create educational and sexual reproductive health care lessons for schools, teachers, and community groups. Science. So our model will be a multi-stakeholder cooperative model. Um, and our members will be people that have experienced abortion themselves or people that provide um, holistic abortion care and a small percentage of investors. But our ecosystem expands beyond that, um, and we will be looking to engage with teachers, schools, activists, um, MPs, healthcare professionals, organisations and clinics. So if you would like to join us um, and make the DOPO we even bigger, um, 
We are looking for support around our financial forecasting. We have a huge list of people that are looking to volunteer with us and that we are working on as we build our strategy and continue working on our um, services and products. Um, but we would we are looking to monetize to be able to pay them because that's part of our model. Um, you can buy us a coffee, um, which is our fundraising platform uh, to financially support our work. And you can join our cooperative soon um, by signing up to our newsletter. And I believe the link is also in the chat. So please do join us um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sachi, for that. Now I'll just wait for all our panelists to be back. Great. Uh, Catherine, would you like to go first this time? Yeah, certainly. Sorry, I just come off mute. No, thank you for that. Um, thanks for sort of sharing your your idea with us and uh, for your very open and, and candid experience as well, personally. So um, you, you talk sort of around about uh, of a we. So how many people have we got in the team at the moment? Um, so it's currently me and Valeria who's been supporting me with the tech. Okay. Um, but with the training, then I'm also working and collaborating with another abortion dealer. With the group support, we're um, collaborating with an existing cooperative. Um, so we're working on different things, but beyond myself. Um, and depending on what we're working on, we're bringing people in. And we also have volunteers um, that, like the group that we've trained that are now coming in and interested in our cooperative model and also sharing their ideas. So, yes. Okay, thank you. And have you got an idea of sort of what kind of size you want that team to be? I know you've talked around, you know, building your strategy, but sort of how many people um, do you think will be in your team? Um, the core team. So into yeah, the core team. The core team, we're looking at around five for now. So myself, social um, and marketing, um, and then like two community management of the like uh, of the providers and the seekers, I guess. So yeah. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rose. Would you like to go next? Yes, actually, thank you very much. And uh, just when uh, it was Festus is, is just commented in, in, in the chat about what a much needed uh, service this is. Um, it's a highly emotive subject matter, as you know. Um, there's lots of areas, you know, are you going to have your, young people? Have you got age restrictions? What are you doing about safeguarding? How can you vet your members so that it doesn't become infiltrated by people with different agendas? So I'm just considering that whole piece around safeguarding and welfare and referring people to agencies because you I know you're a very experienced professional, but you are going to come across, I'm sure, a lot of challenges that just you can't cope with. So I'm just wondering what armory you've got around with you to deal with some of those issues. Um, so this is also why it's been quicker to look at the provider support than the, um, uh, I guess, the people that are seeking support. Although I work with them one-to-one -one on a regular basis um, and we are interviewing them as part of our research. Um, so the model we're looking at for the platform is a sort of triage model. Um, so to onboard them, and it sounds like a lot of work, but we'd rather have a smaller community that would go through this model of having a one-to-one -one conversation with myself or one of a, another provider before they're onboarded onto the platform. And the providers that were, or I keep saying providers, they don't provide a push, they provide support, emotional support. That's what I mean when I say providers, will all have gone through our training. So they're vetted on that side. And it's also like this one-to-one -one call is also to ensure that we're the right platform to ensure support because we don't provide abortions, we don't provide pills, and we don't want to get into that area of providing healthcare. Um, and I'm a member of community that that's how they work. They have a one-to-one -one call and that's a model that we've seen that works. And it also helps them feel safe to know that not everyone is just let in. So there's multiple reasons why we're doing that. And that's, yeah, that's what we're exploring right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin, please. Yeah. Um, so I, one thing that I noticed about um, your, your in your presentation was that you want um, a, a 
certain number of uh, people, certain percentage, I suppose, of uh, people who um, receive support uh, to then go on to support other people. Um, do you have an idea of what percentage that would be? Because I, I, my assumption, and maybe I'm wrong, my assumption would be that a lot of people who go through that experience, um, while they may want to you know, give support, would actually probably want to move on with their lives as well, perhaps. Um, so does it matter how many people... Um, want to stay on to give more support um, and have you factored that into your assumptions of how this will work? Yes, so I guess there's two sort of answers to that question. The first is how we view support and when we talk about support in this sense it's also storytelling, it's also like the support we see on forums of I've been through that, don't worry you're not alone. That's We also see that as a form of support, not necessarily just hey you can go to this person or speak to that person. That that's also the type of emotional support that that people need. Um, so there's that aspect that um, we're not looking to convert them, to train them to provide other forms of support apart from just that community still being part of the community. To answer your question in terms of numbers, um, when I look at the people that I've supported, for example, um, around between 20 and 30 percent help have either taken the course that we just did, were part of that 70, and another, a few of them I trained when I piloted um, running a, a training course at the end of last year. Um, and they vocally, they were the ones, I mean, the course came from them because they were saying, okay, I want to do what you do, can you train me? And then that's the only, <laughs> that's where the course came from. So yes, the percentage is maybe not 100%, but there are around 20 to 30 that have gone through support or receiving support that are then highly invested in supporting others. Great, thank you again to the panelists and to Zachi. We now move on to the last team. So we have uh, Kirsty and Rich from Wings. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, great. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Hi, we are Wings Ethical Food Delivery. My name's Rich. I have my co-founder, Kirsty here with me. Um, this is a journey that started here. Me working as a delivery rider about three years ago, and on quiet days like this, I could wait three, four, sometimes five hours without an order, just sitting there, not earning a penny. And this is the modern gig economy. I didn't know how I was going to pay rent. There's no line manager to contact and talk about. You're just sitting, waiting for your phone to buzz. And this is uh, everyday reality for tens of thousands of people in this sector of the economy. It's insecure, it's stressful, it's frankly dehumanizing. And we're just coming out of a, a pandemic which showed just how essential these workers are keeping society going. And yet this is the deal that they currently have to put up with. So in the past few years, these companies like Deliveroo and Uber Eats have really changed the way we eat, but it has come at a huge cost. Like yes to the people working on their platform, but also environmentally as they encourage the use of petrol mopeds over bikes and for society operating extractive businesses, but business models with no accountability. Um, but this is also an opportunity as customers are waking up to this reality. We have a chance to challenge these companies directly with a unique value proposition. We are the totally ethical alternative, good for riders offering employment and a guaranteed London living wage, good for society and as the only platform with zero emission vehicles, good for the environment too. So as I said, this started with my own experiences in the gig economy. Um, by 2019, uh, I was beginning to seriously look at the idea of, of a platform cooperative as the most effective way to really make change here. Um, 2020 was a, a crazy year for a lot of people. Um, one thing, what we did was uh, paused everything we were doing. I mobilized with a South London charity and some other folks, uh, and we brought together from scratch uh, one of the biggest food distribution operations in, in London to meet the food insecurity needs. So within a few weeks, we'd mobilized over 100 volunteers delivering free, free food packages. That's a ton of food a day feeding about 800 families in South London. 
So it was a very, it was a very stressful time. It was a very exciting time. Um, one of the legacies of that, which was was great for me, is uh, we brought together the team that's now behind Wings and those collaborators I found in that project are the team that are working with me now. So since last summer, we've been working hard. We've been working on our business plans and projections uh, with the support of, of Unfound and other partners. Uh, we've been working with Camden Council, continuing our, our work in the community, delivering free food. Uh, we've secured a startup grant from Islington Council, which is funding our launch. And as we move towards that launch, uh, we've been recruiting riders and restaurants in recent weeks. So where are we headed? Our immediate goal is obviously to become sustainable as a work cooperative. Our projections tell us that to do that, we need to reach around 60 riders and around 1800 orders per week. We have a plan to achieve that operating in North London in the next three years. Looking beyond that, we want to work with restaurant partners on a transition to zero plastic. This picture is of a scheme run by another delivery cooperative in Berlin, which we are keen to bring to London. Uh, in the long term, we want to look at a community share offer so that customers, restaurants and local authorities can all join the cooperative. It's a vision where we replace what, it, what is currently there, one of the most exploitative sectors with a truly community owned infrastructure. So that comes to a final point, which I really want to go into, which is this is such a clear case for the cooperative model. Right. You can look at all these uh, gig employment companies from Deliveroo, Uber, Taxis and Eats, uh, DoorDash in the States, uh, Gorillas and New Kid on the Block. And there's a very clear pattern where when they start, they actually offer a very good deal for the workers. Right, They want to get people on the platform. And then it's once they're there, once they've scaled that platform and they need to make their business model profitable, then they turn the screw. Uh, and that's to satisfy their venture capital investors and the workers, they don't have a say, they have no power. And this is just a clear pattern and we can't wait for another company to come along and just be better. It's clear that this is a structural problem. And so we need a structural solution and it's cooperativism because what you're doing is you're putting the control of this technology and the business itself with the workers. And that's the way you lock in the interests of the workers and you ensure even at every point of scaling, that's what's central in and what drives the business. And the time to do this in food delivery is right now. Um, I, it's sad to say it, but I think we're, we're too late now as a society for a, a cooperative Amazon. That, that company is, is too powerful to be challenged by a co-op now, but not so in food delivery. Uh, Deliveroo, Uber Eats, they're, they're weak and they're under a lot of scrutiny. Um, Deliveroo had a very bad uh, time going on the stock market just a few weeks ago. Um, and the time to act is now because it really is a moment uh, with the public awareness coming out of the pandemic when we really can challenge and take a chunk out of this market. So I'm very uh, excited to say uh, on that note that after a year of preparation, we are launching this Friday um, in Finsbury Park in North London. So it's a very, very exciting moment for us. We've, uh, we've launched the website you see here. Uh, we're getting a lot of buzz on Twitter and uh, a little bit of press. And in the next couple of days, just be looking out for, we hope, some, some national press attention as we build up to our launch, as I say, this Friday. So it is a really exciting time for us after a year building up to this point. Uh, and we want to ask for your help at this crucial moment. If you are in our part of North London, please do consider ordering from us. If you're not, then you can still help us out by getting the word up, word out, signing up to our mailing list, things like that. And finally, please do remember to tip your delivery driver. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Wings. That's really exciting to, to hear you launching on Friday. Um, so maybe we can start with Martin now. Would you like to go first? Uh, sure, yeah. Really interesting idea. Really you know, very much needed. Uh, the story kind of writes itself as to why, why it's necessary. Yeah, really good. But you are up against some very ruthless 
uh, capitalists uh, with very deep pockets and um, a, uh, a desire to win at all costs. You only have to look at some of the dirty tactics companies like Uber have um, uh, under, uh, undertaken over the years to, to get where they are. Um, are you anticipating that? Because you can yeah, you can be a great offer, but in the end, you don't win by just being the good being the good guys, do you? So um, how are you anticipating facing up to the competition? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're under no illusions. These are scary opponents to go up against. They're, they're ruthless. They've got Snoop Dogg in their adverts. They're on the England football t-shirts. You know, they're, they're big, big players. Um, so yeah, we're, we're anticipating it. It's going to be really hard. Um, one... Uh, our strategy, such as it is, uh, is that we are going to be local. Um, that's a sort of market entry strategy, just starting in one neighbourhood and, and spreading gently in North London. Um, and then I think that gives us a chance um, amongst our sort of early adopters um, to build a sense of, of community and loyalty. And, you know, these companies are fighting it out with you know lots of offers, still losing money against each other. But I don't think that, that that shows the fact that there isn't really much loyalty there. And what we're offering, the authenticity of what we're offering, I really think will stand up to these kinds of tactics, where whatever they come at us with, which will probably be lots of offers subsidizing food for their customers. Uh, I do think that the kind of support that we'll get from, from the authenticity of our offer will will see us through. And if it's if it becomes so brazen that they're out to sort of try and squash the, the nice guy, sure. Um, I think that then would sort of backfire, right? And and rally people to us. So it's yeah, I don't think we have a better answer than that, but I think that's probably going to be enough. Okay. Um if you don't mind, because we're we're uh, just a tiny bit behind schedule, tiny bit. If if maybe Catherine and Rose, you can ask your questions one after the other, and then Rich, you can answer both of them in one go. So, uh, Catherine, if you would like to go first, thank you. Yeah, no, mine's going to be very simple. You know, I, I haven't got any further questions to ask. It's just a case of good luck for Friday. I'm rooting <laughs> for you. Thank you. Um, thank you, yeah. and Rose. Uh, yeah, you don't get off that lightly with me. I've got a question for you. Um, I, uh, I, I, Rich and, and, and Kirsty, I think it's brilliant what you're doing. I think absolutely, as you said, it's cooperativism at its best. And one of the reasons that is, is because you have tapped into co-op cycle and you have used, you know, the technology and the capability that's already there, which, you know, means, forgive the pun, you're not reinventing the wheel on this one. You really are absolutely giving yourselves the best chance in, in that tech area. Um but Wings, you know, uh, one of the uh, uh, co-op cycles that set up in, in, in my area through the pandemic, Charlton Bike Delivery, I knew what it did straight away. So how are you going to, on, on Friday, kind of marry up um, Wings and why did you choose Wings as, as the name? Um, and how are you going to kind of mark it and make it really clear to people what you do? I mean, sure. Um, Kirsty can can back me up on the fact that the name was a struggle for weeks and weeks. I like Wings. Uh, I think we're, together with our logo, it speaks to sort of, um, you know, we wanted to get across that we're good, but not in a preachy way. So it's a bit playful. So I like Wings. Um, yeah, we we need to get on on people's radar. We're doing that already. So we have some... Um, some separate strategies for doing this. Uh, we've been active since our launch on social media and really getting, a, you know, 100 plus people joining per day. Uh, and when you're talking about um, a market entry strategy of such a small area, you know, that, that counts for a lot. And then word of mouth will do a lot for us. So I really think we're getting there um, just in terms of the awareness. We'll get hopefully a big hit when we get the, we hope, national press coverage and, and get... That and then we have a, a sort of final advantage, which again I don't think Deliveroo and Just Eat really have, which is um, a different kind of relationship with these restaurants. You know, we're we're nicer to deal with. They believe in us. They believe in this relationship. And all of those restaurants, some of them have been around years. They all have uh, a loyal sort of customer base already, exactly in our area. 
Uh, so some of the more digital ones have have mailing lists and socials and things as well. So that's the final plank of how we're how we're getting out there and getting our, our early customers. Thank you and very best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wings. And yes, good luck. And uh, a big thank you to our panellists, uh, because uh, we won't be hearing from them again uh, uh, after this session. But thank you very much uh, for being here. Um, so uh, it's time for me to share my screen. Um, here we are. So it disappeared. OK. <laughs> So it's time to vote. Um, so I'll just explain briefly how it works. We'll, I'll be sharing a link uh, to a platform called Slido. On uh, this um, platform, you can choose uh, three teams uh, and um, rank them in, in order of preference, um, and then submit your vote. Uh, and then we will be distributing the money proportionally based on how uh, the votes come in and we will be announcing the top three. I'm gonna allow the voting to continue for about two minutes, just to allow anyone who might struggle a bit with tech to, to be able to understand how it works and, and to vote. So use it you know, to stretch maybe and get up and um, it will take us a few minutes then to translate uh, the numbers into uh, prizes. Um, so I will sh share my next slide where you can see the how to connect to the Slido and a summary of the teams. You can connect to the platform in different ways. You can either uh, use a link that Leila will share in the chat, or you can just go to sli.do uh, and enter the code, or you can use your phone um, to um, with the QR code. Uh, we're really basing this vote on trust, so please, please vote once. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will put myself on mute now and, and start the timer. Okay, we are stopping uh, the voting now, thank you. Bear with us a few minutes while we just uh, translate the votes into numbers. If you're still with us, just a few minutes, well, a few seconds while we get Rose back on. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so Rose's camera isn't on yet, just waiting for a few seconds. And thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, we're really happy to see such a great attendance and for your comments in the chat. Um, Thank you really for joining us. Okay, over to Rose when you're ready. Uh, you're muted. Thanks, Vika. That's been very, uh, very tense and, uh, and exciting here at Holly Oak House. And just before I reveal uh, the, the numbers, uh, we do want to say again, thank you to our partners, Stir to Action and the Cooperative Bank. And thank you to our judges, Catherine Douglas and Martin Bryan uh, from Big Revolution. Now, just to be clear, everybody will get a share because we are a cooperative of the full £10,000 uh, fund. But we're going to announce the top three how much, what percentage of the vote that they got and therefore how much of the fund that they will receive. And they will be asking the, the three platforms that I mentioned now to stay on and, and say a few words. So uh, in third place, with 20% of the vote, we have Wings, who will be receiving £2,013. In second place, with just 21% of the vote, just picked you there, uh, is Doppo with £2,063. Uh, and then finally, with 28% of the vote, a total of £2,795 is Red Brick Language School. Congratulations to everybody. Really, really well done. Thank you. So maybe we can just go in order, just um, Rich and then Zachi and then Lucy, if you would just want to say a few words and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, thanks. I, I don't have much to say. It's um, 
it's lovely to have uh, won and thank you to everyone who voted. Um, but really, um, this accelerator has been a joy and all the other teams have been lovely. So um, I, I think everyone deserves it equally and, um, and just shout out to all the great presentations today. Um, please do, whether you're in London or not, please do um, check us out, wings.coop, join our mailing list, that's all I ask. And thanks again. Thank you, Zachi. Um, yes, thank you uh, for the votes, but also like thank you to the other teams because we've worked together for 10 weeks and um, we've worked with each other on each other's projects and presentations and businesses. And we're a really cool group. <laughs> we're all doing very different things, but amazing things. Um, so yeah, uh, my biggest thank you is, yes, of course, to people that voted, but to um, the other people that I've been working with for the past seven weeks. And also, yeah, or if you're in Finsbury Park, order your food um, from Wings on Friday. And if you need to learn English, red brick. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, please. Um, well, what do I say? Thank you so much, um, everyone. Um, the last 10 weeks have been amazing. It's definitely taken us out of our comfort zone. Um, as um, you know, I was, I was going to say we're just teachers. We're not just teachers at all, but we've learned so much. We've broadened our skills. We've networked with people in co-ops. We've learned about cooperation. And we've met some fantastic people in the cohort as well and had lots of experience and um, support from you. So we're incredibly grateful to be at this point. Um, so, yeah, just thank you, everybody. Great. Well, congratulations to everyone. And yes, as everyone has said, um, all teams have been working extremely hard and uh, we're really looking forward to see your next steps and to support you through the way. Um, and yes, please let everyone know that there's an accelerator starting in the autumn and the applications close next Wednesday. We're really looking forward to meet the next cohort as well. Thank you everyone for attending uh, and uh, our partners, uh, our panelists uh, and all the audience. Thank you very, very much. Goodbye, everyone.